Welcome to another episode of the Unbound Book Babes. We are very excited to talk to you today about some libraries that we visited that we think you should visit. Before we jump into that topic, uh, I just want to thank all of our new subscribers for subscribing and all of the comments and engagement you guys have been leaving with us. Um, it's been really fun to pop into the comments, see what you say, and, and have a little chat back. So um, thank you so much. Um, Kristen and I, being the Unbound Book Bays, we both love to travel, and we do a lot of our reading while we're traveling, so... The number of times I've read spicy books in the airport and been like, oh yeah, I can't react, I'm in public. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, one of the things that Kristen and I did uh, at the end of last year was with a group of friends, uh, we took a trip to Ireland and Scotland. And we've mentioned this before, but since we have some new people here, I just want to like catch you guys up to some contextual information going into this episode. Um, when we were in Dublin, we actually visited Trinity College Library and specifically uh, the long room, the very famous barrel roll ceiling long room. You see it in a lot of photos. Um, this was like a must-see for us three girls that were on the trip because uh, my our friend now, uh, Colleen, joined us. And so Trinity College Library is one of the one of the items we're going to be talking about today. And then Kristen's also going to talk to us about the Huntington Beach Library. So uh, if you want to learn more, stay tuned. Sorry, any more coffee? I need to take a break from coffee. <laughs> really quick, I want to mention that if you don't follow us over on Instagram or TikTok, uh, do that because one of the videos that I actually posted recently was me drawing my physical TBR book uh, for the month of March, and I uh, needed the coffee, the coffee break, real quick because uh, I stayed up to two o'clock in the morning reading that book. Uh, I I'm almost <laughs> finished with it. Um, and it is called Hashtag the... book girl problems <laughs> for real. Um, so it's called the soulmate equation. And if you're a nerdy rom-com girl, boy, reader, I don't care who you are. If you love nerdy rom-coms that are just perfect, you should probably read uh, soulmate equation. I've read om I've read all but um, checkmate by Ali Hazelwood. And this rom com, this, this nerdy little, because it's about oh, there's a woman in STEM and blah, 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 blah. This nerdy little rom com is probably, it's better than Allie Hazelwood's. Yeah, it is. It's so good. It's so funny. And then the two best friends kind of remind me of interactions that uh, Kristen and I have. So <laughs> that <laughs> just like the chaos that is their friendship. And I'm just like here for it. So. Uh, thanks for uh, humoring me on letting you know what I'm reading and my little coffee break because I'm tired. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Trinity College. Okay, so Trinity College Library is more than just the long room. I think that's an important place to like start because when you look it up, those are the pictures that you see. And we didn't visit the rest of the library and they've actually i think they've opened more exhibits since we've been there and i'm kind of bummed because they look pretty cool i'm going to mention them a little bit later on um and i'm going to include a map um as well so trinity college library is the largest library in ireland and it dates back to 1592. that is not something i knew that it dated back that far because I like when we visited so much of my focus was on the long room that I only thought about those dates and times but um so and that's back when the college was established and so uh quoted from their website which I have linked in the show notes which I'll link uh to our website down below uh, to the show notes so you can pop over there and click on these links and go check out some of this some more information for yourself if you want um, and maybe plan your trip because I highly recommend it um, Dublin in general I just highly recommend <laughs> So it says, today it has over 6 million printed volumes with extensive collections of journals, manuscripts, maps, and music reflecting over 400 years of academic development, which like blows my mind because I mean, 
I wonder what the oldest library in the world is. Stay tuned for a future episode. Um, Because now I'm going to go down a rabbit hole. Um, (laughs) (laughs) So the main focus of the Trinity College Library is actually research. So, and it's, it's really highly regarded internationally as a research library. One of the most popular items in the library is the Book of Kells and the Book of Darrow. And they are, the Book of Kells specifically is a 19th century Gothic manuscript. And it was presented by Harry Jones, the Bishop of, I'm sorry guys, Bishop of Meath, the, and the former vice chandler of the university in 1660. Wow. And Something really great about the the college library is it's actually open to visit seven days a week. So even if you're there on a weekend or a Sunday, you can go and you can check it out. I can't remember what day we went. Let me look. <laughs> right behind me. We went on Monday, November 6th. <laughs> um, a quick aside. I was too curious to wait. The oldest library in the world. I'm going to absolutely butcher the name of it. Um, Al-Kawarwin? Q-A-R-A-W-I-Y-Y-I-N is in Fez, Morocco. From It dates back to 859 AD. Thank you for looking that up. I was too curious. I couldn't help myself. Like I said, if you're planning your visit, my little shadow box that I made of our trip is right behind me. (laughs) So I actually just popped up and looked because that receipt right there is actually from the Book of Kells uh, ticket purchases. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So we went on a Monday, but yeah, they're open seven days a week. They have a pretty good website. So check it out. And actually, once you're in the main gates... um, it's pretty easy to find the building to to buy your tickets. So easy, in fact, that I bought too many too quickly. If you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby was so anxious that day, you guys. I was excited and anxious all at the same time. It was a problem. Um, miscommunications happen. <laughs> so but the Irish people are so nice. They gave us a refund. <laughs> yeah, because I'm a ding dong. But I was so embarrassed that I made somebody else go get the refund. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, what were you saying about the chaos in that book and their friendship? <laughs> chaos incarnate everywhere we go. <laughs> yup. <laughs> so the the part we've all been waiting for about the Trinity, uh, the long room. So this is part of the old library, and it houses over two hundred thousand of the library's oldest books. Um. And it's in these very beautiful, huge oak bookcases. It's this whole room is just oak lined and and gorgeous. Um, It was originally built in 1712, uh, between 1712 and 1732. And it had actually a flat plaster ceiling originally. And... The only shelves that were there were the shelves on the lower level. And so I'll pop in a picture so you can get some context of of what I mean. So you'll see in the photo where the balcony starts, that used to be the old roof line. In 1801, the library has been given the right to collect any book published in 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 Great Britain and Ireland for free. This is called... um, it was endowed with legal deposit. So it's basically saying legal deposit is meaning that it has a right to reach out to any publisher and say, hey, we would like to have that book on our shelves. Can can you send us a copy? And then for free, the publisher will uh, send a copy to the library so they can house it in the library, which I think is fantastic. Do you think they have a copy of the British Akatar and Brit- British Crescent City? I would actually really love to know that. (laughs) Maybe in other parts of the library, maybe not specifically in the long room. (laughs) (laughs) Not quite a classic yet. (laughs) Do you think they have Lord of the Rings? So, uh, Harry Potter. 
I don't know. Oh no! I am so sorry for side. Tr <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. I don't drag people in the weeds. Keep going, <laughs> <laughs> Kristen. Dragging us in the weeds. Hmm. Never saw that before. Uh <laughs> Random thought. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so, in they had so many books that in 1860 the roof was raised and the famous stunning barrel rolled ceiling was constructed with the upper shelvings in the balcony. So that has been around since 1860s. Which can we just talk really quick about the architecture back in like the eight, the mid 1800s? Because walking around like Dublin and um, Glasgow and Edinburgh, like so beautiful and some of those yes. edinburgh is even older than that in a lot of places um especially like on uh the magnificent mile but like you guys it's so beautiful i already want to go back i actually met a scottish uh woman at an antique store and she's like i said i want to go back to scotland and spend some more time there and she was like oh here's some recommendations i was like okay now i really have to go back so i can come back to this woman at this antique store and be like hey i went you don't remember me but i did what you said thank you um <laughs> so, so in the long room it's actually the shelves they're like equally spaced they're really cool i'll throw in some more pictures but they actually have 14 busts that line the long room and they are comprised of great philosophers and writers um, of the western world so some of those busts are of like jonathan jonathan swift which is arguably apparently the most popular one uh homer isaac newton plato william shakespeare wolf tone so lots of very and they have a really cool list um on their website of who's the who who the sculpture is of and then actually the artist uh who did the sculpture so that was really great to see but recently i want to do you think the jonathan swift one is so popular because people think it might be taylor swift's great great grandfather or great 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 grandfather you know i'm not saying it is I'm that's just a saying good question people probably think that <laughs> I bet that's why it's the most popular. People are like, oh my god! That's why she's so good at writing songs. I'm going to Google something heinous right now. <laughs> related, first thing, is Jonathan Swift related to Taylor Swift? I kid you fucking not, you guys. Look at this. Look at this. Nailed it! I knew people <laughs> thought that would think would, yeah, people thought. No relation to Taylor, at least. None that I'm aware of. I'm shocked. I'm blown away. I can't believe they're not related. Just kidding. Um, I told you that everybody thought he was. <laughs> Look at this Reddit. I wonder how many Reddit posts are here. Seven, seven comments three years ago. <laughs> Does it mention the library? I can't. It's too small for me. Oh my gosh. I feel like if she were, she would know. And as a result, we would have at least one song about the connection. Looking up her family tree as far back as she can definitely sounds like a perfectly nerdy side project for her. <laughs> so Kristen, that is perfect though because speaking of Taylor Swift and just women in general, uh four sculptures of women have actually been added to the library and they are the first uh to be commissioned in over a century. So maybe wow. someday Taylor Swift will have her uh well she's not English. No. No, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Anyways, <laughs> Moving on. Um, those four women, uh, I want to give them the moment that they deserve uh, as being the first sculptures added to this famous library in over a century. Rosalind Franklin, she's a scientist whose work was central to understanding the structure of DNA at a molecular level. She actually died when she was 37 years old because I, I also went on a little bit of a tangent when I was Googling this stuff. <laughs> so, okay. She discovered DNA, but didn't she not get credit for that while she was alive? Probably not. <laughs> this is back in the early 1900s, so yeah. unlikely. Else... Definitely. Fascinating. Well, 37? 37. Wow. That's what I said. I didn't get too deep into why, but I know she did stuff with x-rays and stuff, so I was like, did she give herself oh. ra radiation to poisoning yep. too? Yep. Like, yeah. So, I don't know. That's just me, like, 
I didn't go in that deep of a dive because I had to roll through these other women too. Augusta Gregory, she is a dramatist and theater founder. Ada Lovelace, she's a mathematician. And Mary Wollstonecraft, the pioneer of women's rights uh, and advocacy. So, wow. Super cool for those women. Um, again, um, I'm really glad that I was able to go there and see some rep representation of women, not only in lit literature, but the STEM uh, part as well, being represented in the college. And I'm really, really excited that they decided to go that direction. So it, there's a couple, there's two other things that I want to mention that are at the library that are pretty famous um, outside of the Book of Kells and just the stunning architectural component of the, the long room itself. It also holds um, one of the last Oh, like copies of the 1916 proclamation of the Irish Republic, which was read on April 24th, 1916 by Patrick Parse outside the general post office bes before the start of the Easter rising. If you guys do not know what the Easter rising was, um, Great Britain held, um, I'm so sorry, I'm so <laughs> tired. So, if you don't know the history of Ireland and Great Britain, what is that called? Google it. Not you, them. <laughs> if you don't know the history, Google it. <laughs> yeah, Google the history. But so <laughs> occupancy, like they owned Ireland. They had occupancy of Ireland, kind of like we had in America. We had our you know, revolution. We talk about like the Boston Tea Party and like all that stuff. But um. They had the Irish Republic, which was fighting for Irish independence. That's a long story, very short. Google it. It's quite fascinating, the turmoil that happened. Um, so it is actually, it ended up being kind of crazy. So it lasted, the Easter, Easter Rising lasted for six days and it was very brutal. And it was like, you know, the Irish Republic went and took occupancy of strategic buildings in Dublin that were like government buildings. And then the Great Britain, and this is at the, during World War One. So they actually sent troops to Ireland, to Dublin. And there was like uh, warfare in the streets of Dublin. So the Irish Republic actually lost. There was an unconditional surrender of rebel forces and execution of most leaders. 16 uh, leaders were uh, hung, I believe. But oh. the Irish Republic actually, um, if you look at the casualties, they had half the casualties of the British army, which I thought was quite fascinating because it just stands to tell that when you know, you believe in something and you rebel, like, you can make a dent, you can, like, stand up for what you believe in and, and do what's right. There, there's actually this really cool picture. It's not at the library, uh, just the, the proclamation, the 1916 proclamation, a copy of it is. There's a picture of some of the leaders and people in front of a building and it, their slogan was, I don't know. It just like resonated with me. The world's a freaking mess still to this day. So it just was, I was just thinking a lot about it. And it says, we serve neither King nor Kaiser, but Ireland. So they're talking about like, we don't serve anyone but our country and our people. And I thought that was kind of cool. I have links to some of this below if you want to learn more about some of the history and specifically about the Easter Rising, but it was a bloody battle in the streets of Dublin for six days. One other really cool thing is actually a harp. So... It's a medieval harp on display, and it's called the Branborough Harp. The harp is the oldest of its kind in Ireland. It has incorrectly become associated with the great Irish king, Brian Burrow, who died in 1014. Although its early history is uncertain, it probably dates from the 15th century, and it is made of oak and willow with 19 brass strings and it is the model for the emblem of Ireland. So when you think of Ireland, there's the harp. Uh, this is the model for it. It's it's beautiful. It's, I wish, I want to know how heavy it is because it kind of looks heavy. I'll throw a picture in. Um, it's very cool. Bobby's wondering how much she's got to lift to steal it. <laughs> I would never steal an Irish treasure, but I would love to just like do that to the strings, like my impulsive 
<laughs> ADHD wants to touch it um, and be like, what does it sound like? Does it still sound whimsical, like a harp? Um, actually, remember at the generator, when, uh, it's a hostel in Dublin that we stayed at, there was the lady playing the harp and singing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was pretty cool. My favorite part, you guys, about the library was the old books, some of these old books they specifically put on display were pieces um, with edge paintings on them. I'll throw in some pictures because I took a lot of pictures of these. My favorite one was like this painting of like what you think would be on a chapel and then the ship. But so like, I don't know, I have lots of books with like painted edges and they've become super popular again, like special editions and stuff like that. But like, there was a lot of older books that had these beautiful edge paintings on them and i'm just like i want all of them <laughs> i want to actually those are you know how some people put books backwards on their bookshelves to see the ones that they haven't read mm -hmm. i want a bookshelf of all edge painted books like really cool ones because like the sprayed edges like now are nothing compared to the detail in these you guys i'm telling you like the dragons on the fourth wing with the black pages and the silver or like some of the other ones that i have they do not hold a candle to the detail in these these they're just so beautiful it's tr it's truly art like somebody actually painted these um for fire safety you shouldn't be holding a candle to any books um fire safety 101 yeah don't do that <laughs> as I have a candle next to my books <laughs> but <laughs> in every episode but um yeah super cool that was danger. my favorite part danger Lana um so um what was your favorite part of the long room Kristen um I don't know if it was my favorite part but it's the part that stuck with me the most so while we were there they had a giant globe uh, hanging from the ceiling. Um, and it was kind of cool, but the part that I couldn't get over is that if you have a globe, do you know where this is going? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why clouds? Why do you have clouds so big you can't see, well, most of Ireland? Like, why clouds? It's not like they were moving with the weather patterns. It wasn't like a living display that I know of. Um, it just seems so bizarre as to why you would pick. So I to cover countries. <laughs> I actually have a photo that I'll throw in here, you guys, that talks about what this is an exhibit. It's an uh, and th there was another place actually because there the same exhibit was in um the art in science building at the base of um uh arthur's seat in edinburgh because when i walked in to find the bathroom <laughs> i saw i was like hey that's the same thing that's in the the college but i have a picture of what it is it's uh g-a-i-a -A gaia is that, that how sounds you right yeah so it's it's called gaia which is named after an earth goddess but the gist of it, if the print is too small, if you pause the video and read or try to read, the gist of it is the perspective of Earth from the International Space Station and the feeling that um, scientists and astronauts get when they look at the Earth outside of the window. And because a lot of them talk about the, like, the awareness of just how small, like, how grand and beautiful Earth is, but how small in retrospect to the entire universe we truly are. So that is the intention of that exhibit. But I thought it was so funny because Kristen's there and Colleen and they, and I can't remember which one of you said it first, but they're like, you can't even see Ireland. It's covered in clouds. <laughs> it's covered in clouds. It's at the top. You're at the bottom. Like, what could possibly be the point of this? I... You know what? If you have to explain it, it's not for me. I want to look at it and get it, and I just... I didn't get it. <laughs> like I said in our last episode, Easter eggs are not for me. Like, a lot of people love them and get them, and I'm over here like, no, nah, it's dumb. It doesn't rotate. The clouds don't move. You can't <laughs> even see, like, the laser show in Ibiza. Stupid. <laughs> 
So that is the information that I have to share today with uh, or about Trinity College Library and specifically the long room. I highly recommend it to anybody who goes. I was very emotional while I was there. I was like, oh my gosh, I, you know, it just is, you feel so small um, in the world when you're in somewhere that holds so much vast knowledge. One other thing right now actually is a lot of the shelves were actually empty when we visited because they're going through a very intensive cleaning and restoration project for these tomes to keep them in good shape. And I think that's really great and fascinating because if I was like a I don't know. I know the library is endowed, but I'm not exactly sure how tuition or taxes get contributed. But that is something um, that I would love for my tax dollars to go do. You know, the the saving and restoration and the protection of these old um, documents um, because knowledge and books are are power and they're very fascinating. And I think we should be making sure that we preserve them. So. And it's also really cool just to see the structure behind the books as well, because like when you're there, if they're all there, you would not see um, just how crazy these shelves are. Uh, so if you go it anytime soon, just be aware that um, they're slowly taking them down and cleaning them and then putting them back. So you may not see all of the shelves full. If you want to see more content like this, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified every time we upload. It really helps us out. That was a big one. That was that was great. That was fantastic. Thanks. I try. Um, <laughs> mine's not as earth shattering. Mine's more feelings. No, um, that's great. Because when you told me about <laughs> about this library, I was like, man, I really want to go now. Like next time I'm down there, I'm gonna just go walk around. So tell us more about it, Kristen. Yeah, um, Huntington Beach Library in Huntington Beach, California. Um, this is just a beautiful architectural masterpiece that uh, if I ever build a home, it's going to be built like this library. It's got plants inside. It's got waterfalls and water and just such a calming atmosphere that is not like the deathly uncomfortable silence that you get in a lot of modern libraries of like, Shh, everybody be quiet. It's like, you just want to be quiet so you could enjoy the ambiance. Mm. Freaking love it. Um, as soon as I saw it, I was like, I got to go there. So I was going out to California to visit my brother and I was like, hey, man, uh, like, I know you like to sleep in. So in the morning, I'm going to go to Huntington Beach Library and I'll meet up with you guys for like lunch. And they're like, no, nah, we'll go with you. Um, and I was like, cool, 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 cool. Um, it's my brother's birthday, and we're going to do what I want to do. <laughs> he's a stellar guy like that. <laughs> so although I really wish I could share the car ride there with everybody, um, because my brother's just so funny, um, you'll just have to imagine the funniest thing you've ever heard, and that's how our car ride went. But... Um, yeah, so you're on the outside of the building, and it's a very unassuming, it just looks like a library, right? Kind of like an old, an older high school that you're kind of walking up to, uh, very unassuming. And then you walk in, and like, there's just this huge spiral ramp that takes you down into the lower levels. Um, it's got a huge water fixture um, right in the middle of it. Yes, Bobby Joe. That reminds me <laughs> so much of the library uh, in the mountain of Akatar that Nesta works in. Yes. The spiral. It's, it's probably what it was designed off of. Just kidding. I don't know that. But <laughs> yeah, like that spiral that takes you down. Um, but it, it's kind of... It's kind of a bummer because the spiral, it just goes down like one level and then like you're done. Like you can't like go off to different levels. Mm -hmm. It's not that, it's not as grand as probably the one Nesta works in where like gotcha. the spiral and then you get off a level and then you keep going down. And there's no monster at the bottom. Well, actually there was a monster in this story, but we'll get to that. Also, tangent, sorry, it's my turn for tangents. Um... <laughs> Can you imagine like a book of cards going down a ramp? Like how big, how big, if the library in Akatar is as big as it says, 
I my sci my math brain wants to do the math of the helix that would have to happen for it to be like not so abrupt that they're constantly fighting these heavy carts full of books. Which I, I mean, going down is probably not the problem, right? Going back up is the nightmare. Yeah, but like. <laughs> I actually think I might have an equation that I could do that. I'm not going to, but I could if I wanted to, probably, maybe. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> I'm thinking about the specific... Uh, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm, continue. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So when I was there, there was a uh, statue of a samurai warrior. I don't know if that's a permanent fixture um, or if it was just there for... A display uh Unzies. an easter egg i don't know i don't think i'm using that term correctly anymore um <laughs> but that was pretty cool and then um so when we walked in so my brother is an architect i don't know if i've said that yet or not but so he's an architect in california so when we walked in we're like man this is cool and so both of us are just out wandering around the library <laughs> sorry <laughs> We're just like wandering the library, looking at all the architecture, looking at 0% of the books or anything, just like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then we kind of like wander back together and I'm like, dude, like it's given like 70s vibes. Like this has got to be, have been built like in the 70s. And he's like, yeah, that part over there is 70s, but this part over here is like a 90s architecture that was like mimicking the 70s. And I'm like, yeah, it's very different. And then, come to find out, uh, it was actually built in 1967, opened in 1975, and then it was, there was an expansion done in 1994. Um, so we were content to argue about that, but um, his wife was like, guys, I'll just Google it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> taking a step back the original library in huntington beach opened in 1909 um it went through several renditions at one point it was the carnegie library um but that one was destroyed or took on damage in an earthquake mm -hmm. and so the one as it stands today was built in 1967 by the firm of richard and dion nuetra um However, shortly after signing the agreement, Richard Nuetra passed away, um, and his son Dion was re was uh, retained to design the project. In 1994, it was expanded by the architects uh, Anthony and Langford, um, and they did their best to kind of keep the the aesthetic, basically. So they um, in 1994, that's when they enclosed that spiral ramp, and it was no longer outside. Oh, it was outside? It, yeah, it was outside, and then they expanded to enclose a lot of that within it. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. Um, so the new wing in 1994 included a children's area and its own storytime theater. Uh, the lower level features five new meeting rooms, a catering kitchen, and a 319-seat theater. Um, and this is still actually to your point. What? This this is still there, like yeah, it's huge, it's massive. Wow. Um, and it's it's more of a community center with books. But you know, uh, we did that episode about how much you can do at libraries and how they're more than just books. For real, yeah, I'll link it up There's, here in the top, uh, you guys. Yeah, so the v this library actually also has a VA assistance center mm -hmm. thing. So you can go and uh, get VA. I don't really know the intricacies of it, so don't <clears throat> catch me lying on that. But there's a building, there's a little room that says VA assistance. So <laughs> I don't know what you can get there. <laughs> but, it's there. Um, but back to your how you're getting books around a library uh the huntington beach library was an early adopter of using an automated conveyor system to move books throughout the building what yes i am not exactly sure what that means um but that's how they 
move books. Oh, I didn't look into that further. That's really neat though. Like this library is wild. You guys it is so beautiful. I'll, I'll put pictures in, but like, I really want to go there. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to want to spend all day there because you're truly going to want to just like sit and enjoy the areas. Because the other thing that they did is it's like multi-tiered or multi-leveled. So there's like two levels ish, but they're broken out so that everything's really sectioned off. So that way you can have like a study section and it's only like a couple of tables. Um, and then there's just multi levels to spread everybody out, right? So you're not you're not sitting in like thirty tables in one little area. It's beautifully done. Tons of natural light, the plants, the water. It all just gives it a really calming atmosphere that you want to be in. Oh my gosh, I found a photo of the spiral before it was enclosed. Sorry. I was yes. listening to everything you said, but like, this is the spiral before yeah. it was enclosed. It's huge. It's massive. Wow. You guys. Yeah. If this you're in Huntington so cool. Beach, it's, it's just a beautiful area. I was on a mission to find that photo. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so then this, this is kind of a... Kind of a big thing that happened between like the 90s and the 2000s. I feel like across the country, um, but specifically here, they remodeled some of it. And so uh, they took or they went back to like a lot of neutral colors, natural like sandstone palette, um, as opposed to that like green color scheme that you see, that greenish blue color scheme that was originally envisioned by the architect Dion Nuetra. And uh, I mean, you grew up in the 90s. You remember everywhere like that striking color. Um, or maybe it was just me, but I miss it. I miss those pops of color. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking but, about yeah, but. quintessential like 90s to me is like the bright, crazy colors on the cups and ta Taco Bell. <laughs> like, <Yep. laughs> like, uh, yes, 90s girls dream. But even my high school did that, right? Where it was built, I want to say in like the 70s or 80s. So it was like a colorful, and then they redid it in the 2000s. And now it's just like Beige. a building. Yeah. I'm sure they spent a lot on it and I'm sure they're, but it's just boring now. <laughs> um, and Huntington Beach did the same thing. A return to neutrals. Uh, the last little highlight is of the librarian that worked there from 1985 to 2008 ron hayden um and he the most important thing that he did was that he kept the library funded and he ensured its survival by establishing innovative revenue streams through development fees media and room rentals video conferencing and then a friends of the library used book sales oh cool um so again in our library episode we kind of talked about how libraries get funding and how um, a small portion of that funding comes from their local government based on, like, library holders, library card holders. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it is private donors. A lot of it is donations made to the libraries is what they're surviving off of. Mm -hmm. um, and so our boy Ryan Hayden, Ron Hayden, our boy Ron Hayden, um, he got very creative with library funding and making Sweet. sure that, you know. Very cool. Because libraries are fairly central. They're really important to the community that they're mm -hmm. in. And it, like it, I continue to say, until people believe me, it's more than just books. Mm -hmm. It's more, you know, it's free internet. It's having a place to go. It's all sorts of life skills that you can learn, all the different things that these libraries offer. Um, I'm going to keep preaching that until people start visiting their local libraries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Um, but in 1992, Ron Hayden uh, was named Librarian of the Year by the California Library Association. Good for so you. So he was recognized for all of his hard work. Good. Rightfully so. Yeah. Oh, I love books, y'all. <laughs> I, I mean, know. that's why we're all here. <laughs> I want to do a library tour of America. <gasps> that 
would be so fun. Yup. Share with us your favorite library, your small town library. Give us, tell us the best libraries to go to. Yes. Bookstores will be a different adventure. I want libraries. Yeah. Leave a comment down below telling us what library we should research and cover next and maybe even visit. If we're close enough, we will happily do so. Um, so thank you so much for, for listening with us today. And until next time, keep reading. <laughs>